Thank you for joining the third town hall in our back to school in the time of COVID series. Tonight's guest is Washington State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Chris Reichdahl. We've collected questions through social media and constituent mail, and we'll be using those questions to drive this discussion. If you're watching this live on Facebook and have a question, please ask in the comment section of this video, and we'll answer questions from live viewers as well. Before we get to questions, I'm going to hand it over to Congressman Heck and then Superintendent Reichdahl for opening comments. Congressman Heck. Thank you, Lauren, very much. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, and yes, our third in a series of seven town halls on the issue of a COVID-19 response in the school system from kindergarten all the way through graduate school. This is, however, the 24th town hall we've had in our ongoing series about our state's response to COVID-19 and the pandemic. Tonight's fairly special. It's our first return guest. We're doing this so often, we finally have a return guest. Uh, no one better to talk about what's happening this week, which is the resumption of schools on some kind of basis, than our elected state superintendent of public instruction, Chris Reichdahl, finishing his first term. For those of you who may not know about Chris's background, it's pretty interesting. He's the youngest of eight children uh, raised in Snohomish County, and he is an extremely proud graduate of Washington State University. He'll tell you that at the drop of a hat. He won't tell you he was summa cum laude. I just did. Uh, the only thing I hold against him in terms of higher education, however, is he got his graduate degree at the University of North Carolina, and we all know about their rivalry with Gonzaga University's basketball team. Chris went on to be a high school social studies teacher, a school board member, a state legislator, a budget and fiscal analyst for the State Board for Community Colleges, and then four years ago was elected state superintendent of schools. And he is, again, a guest returning. Chris, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Good to see you all. Thank you. First question on everybody's mind. How and who are making the decisions about the basis on which school resumes? And by I the way, before you, before you say, answer this, I just have to say, somebody told me the other day when I mentioned you were gonna be a guest on this town hall, that's the second worst job in all of state government because of the <laughs> challenge of figuring out how to do this. Who, who and how are these decisions being made, Chris? It is a once in a hundred year global pandemic. And so, yeah, it's a complicated job right now. And I'm grateful to be partnering with a lot of folks uh, to try to make solution out of a tough time. So I'm really glad you asked the question, Congressman, because uh, there's a lot of misinformation about this. The governor of the state of Washington has this, the, the statutory authority, emergency powers to do things like forcibly close schools. There are two other sort of decision makers who could do that. A local health official, as we have seen in Pierce County, that is the only county where a local health official has made that determination. And of course, a local school board, uh, they, can, they can make a decision. No one can force a school into an opening, uh, not even the Office of Superintendent of Public Instructions. So I can either forcibly close them or open them. Um, it has always been the case that local school boards, even pre-COVID, could have said, uh, hey, you know what, we're going to have a fully online school in this district. Now, they don't because the great wraparound services that we built in schools is really the best uh, scenario for kids. Uh, but, but truly, the governor and emergency powers to close and local school districts primarily to determine when to open. Now, some health thresholds have been put in place. The governor has instituted those with his uh, Department of Health. They are a cabinet agency. And it's very clear, high, medium, and low risk counties is the category. Above 75 cases per 100,000 over 14 days is high. 25 to 75 is medium and below 25 is low. We've got some districts below 25 and they're opening face to face. We've got another couple dozen that are in hybrid models because they're in that medium risk category. But many, many districts are either medium or high risk counties and they are choosing to start the year remotely. So the bottom line is if you're over 75 cases per 100,000, 75 cases of infection over 100,000, then you will be opening strictly on a remote basis. If you're between 25 and 75 per 100,000 population, then it can be a hybrid. And if you're below 25, you can be, you can be all in person. Is that fair to say? That is a really fair way to describe the public health officials perspective of this. Technically at the end of the day, this is up to a local school board. And while they are being super diligent to that framework, they could forcibly open even in high risk, but they are choosing wisely to follow the health experts on this. Do you have a sense of what is planned for this and next week in terms of it all with respect to the fully in-person hybrid and fully remote? Can, can you characterize this in any way mathematically that 
helps people understand the, what are we at? 1.1 million school children. I'm probably yeah. lost track here. Let's do it in percentages as best we could know this about 48 hours ago, which is somewhere in the 95% range, 94% of, of students will start their year fully remote. Uh, three or 4% will start their year in a hybrid model and probably 1% of students or fewer will start fully in person. Those are small, very small rural areas that are in that low risk category. So virtually all kids are starting uh, this year remote. So Chris, when we last talked, and I don't recall the date, Lauren, why don't you look that up while we're visiting just to remind us and help people kind of put the bookends on the progression of this conversation. Now, there, was a lot of com there was a lot of talk during our last town hall about the things that school districts were doing and that uh, the information you were collecting to help them get better prepared to offer distant learning. A lot of discussion about devices and connectivity and software uh, platforms and training of staff people uh, and the acquisition of equipment, PPE where required, uh, and a lot of conversation about logistical uh, complications associated with things like transportation, for example. School buses built to halt 62 students sitting by, side by side, obviously not an option in this day and age. What I'd like you to do is talk some, describe some if you can, about the progress that has been made since spring, because I think most people would acknowledge it was kind of a hot mess in the spring. This thing came upon us so suddenly, and it wasn't as though we all sat around with three-inch note, uh, three-ring notebook binders with a prepared preparedness plan for a pandemic. We kind of got caught off guard, as did the whole world. So describe the progress that's been made. Yeah, last spring, um, about the same time uh, Governor Inslee closed our schools to in-person learning, virtually every state within a week or so did the same thing. About 53 million U.S. school children were not in their physical buildings for learning. We were a state that kind of flipped the switch, though, and said we are going to do some continuous learning. Um, as you said, no state was prepared for this. In fact, we saw some of them just say we're done for the year. Uh, we wanted to push through with some learning. What have we learned since then? Um, we've instituted guidance now that is a dramatic transformation of the experience that families had last spring. Uh, this time, they will experience school districts that have a mandatory uh, requirement to provide their learning as they would a regular year. And what I mean by that is 180 school days, uh, which they've got some flexibility around, a thousand instructional hours, so it is a full year. Uh, those instructional hours will look a little bit and sometimes a lot like what they'd experience at school, teacher delivering lessons, sometimes students working independently, but all of it structured and guided by a professional certificated teachers. We put together requirements of daily schedules, weekly schedules. We are grading again. Uh, we are assessing. Students are getting letter grades. This is a full-blown uh, remote learning model. Um, and we're starting with new classes. So the message I always have for students was, hey, we have 30 weeks under our belt last year when this occurred in March. We knew a lot about you and teachers had a really good ability to understand where you were in a particular class. Um, and so they made really good decisions about students' performance and grades and, and assessment. We're starting over, this is a new year. Kids are getting new teachers. And so the same things we would normally do, which is screening for academics and screening for social emotional learning, those are all part of our requirements. Each district has a reopening plan that's brought through their board uh, through public input. So a significantly better infrastructure. We've trained probably 7,000 new teachers this summer, uh, existing ones, but under how to deliver uh, teaching remotely with uh, what we call student learning management systems that aren't five and six. So families are navigating multiple systems, but they're down to one, maybe two, uh, so they can really truly uh, engage in the learning and not have the technology tripping them up. So many industries take years to do this. We've had 20 weeks to go to a fully remote model in the state of Washington. I'm very proud of what we've done. It is not ideal. It's not what we would design if we could build a system uh, absent COVID, but it is light years ahead of where we were 20 weeks ago. Did you say you had trained six to 7,000 teachers? Yes, and we've been, we're gonna continue that training uh, for the next uh, six to eight weeks as part of their professional learning. And we think we might get to 15 or 16,000 teachers in the state uh, getting really intensive training on their learning management systems in terms of remote. Out of 15 or 16,000, what's the total teacher core in Washington uh, So in classroom teacher, I'm guessing we're at about 75,000 in the state. I'd have to check that number, yeah. Chris, would you agree that in-person learning is still to be preferred if able to be done safely to distance learning? 
No question about it. That we've had distance learning models. We've got opportunities and choices for families to do that today. Uh, I think the reason many of them don't do that is, is the sheer power of in-person learning. Yes, there's content exchange. So teachers teaching lessons, evaluating learning real time. But the power of learning, of course, is learning not just um, with your peers, but from your peers. The exchanges that happen in a classroom, uh, no matter the content area, is very, very powerful. And of course, for young kids in particular, we're teaching them how to be little people. <laughs> they're learning relationship skills and they're learning how to respect other people's space and they're learning these lessons of hard work and discipline and all the other things. And so in-person is a model we have built. It is successful. It has led our state to be one of the most powerful economically because of our great public school systems and the fact that it develops such a great workforce. That's happened because we're in person. Kids who need nursing supports, mental health supports, our relationship with county partners for chemical dependency and other things. Um, our schools have been built like robust little wraparound support systems. And uh, that's what we want to get back to when it's safe to do so. Chris, I'm getting a lot more up energy from you than I did several months ago when we talked. I have to tell you, uh, as an old friend of mine, I could feel the weight of what you were going through at the time. It jumped off the screen. It was obviously weighing you down as you attempted to manage this process of trying to develop these guidelines and recommendations and the like. Uh, today feels differently, like there's some more positive energy than there was. That said, there must be some aspect of this or some aspects of this that you're concerned about going forward. What is it that worries you most about uh, pulling this off in the next week or two throughout the state? Two things. Um, we've closed the gap a lot in technology. Uh, so that comes in two fronts. Hardware, which districts have primarily partnered with um, uh, nonprofit and private partners to really distribute a tremendous amount of hardware to kids. And then getting computers or laptops into the hands right. of every kid. Right. They need a device that's affected and they need a connection. So we've gotten uh, a good bit of progress done there, but we've got another, say, 50,000 connections we think we can make. Um, and again, we're going as fast as we can with these federal dollars. So I'm still nervous about that. I will say the governor's proclamation, though, tells school districts, unlike last spring, you are available to serve students if you cannot do it remotely. So there is an opportunity for districts to build one-to-one -one relationships with families to say, we realize you're rural, you're remote, you absolutely can't connect. Let's figure out a way to get uh, you what you need, even if it's in our building. So connectivity and the bigger issue is childcare. Normally we would be talking about a school system of five to 18 year olds who have a place to go to learn great things, to develop who they wanna be and simultaneously underwrite our labor market because as parent or guardian gets to go to work and kid gets to go to school. Um, it is not safe to do so in many communities based on public health uh, recommendations. And so we find ourselves with a lot of young people at home uh, who simultaneously want to keep learning, but mom and dad are not comfortable leaving them there. And I sure wouldn't be there with an elementary school age student. And so that has been excruciating. That is part of why I'm still not totally excited. Uh, I, I lose a lot of sleep over this and a lot of heart over this. And we talk with community partners and private partners and parents, sisters, your nurses, and everyone else to deliver support. There isn't an extra $500 million or billion dollars to suddenly roll out childcare for everyone who needs it. Um, and so I know the legislature is grappling with this a lot. One of the reasons many of them want to get back and make some hard choices. Uh, but that's the one enormous challenge that everyone in the country is facing right now. Uh, one minute, please, Chris. I want to do a technological check-in with Lauren. Chris's last answer was pretty garbled to me because of a fuzzy connection. I'm wondering if that's just at my location or was that the case on your end as well? I heard that as well. So I think if you could repeat part of your last answer, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, Congressman Heck asked me about, you know, there's still some things that I probably lose sleep over, and one is connectivity, but we're getting pretty good at that, devices, and then uh, Wi-Fi connections or broadband connections, but the second one is child care. Uh, we do have a number of families in our communities who understand why school isn't opening on the recommendation of public health, but that doesn't mean they have an easy child care solution for many of them who have to go to work, and so we've tasked school districts with taking responsibility of helping families broker child care or supports in their community. Um, it's going very well in some places, and it's really, really tough in others because this economy, this COVID impact has hit child care providers very, very hard. And so there are some places that aren't open today that were open six months ago. 
So um, we so have a this question. Is, this is the one place where we're still losing sleep, and I know the legislature. Uh, so we have a question coming up later from a constituent about child care. Maybe we can plumb that a little before we lose our connection altogether. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was a little bit garbled toward the end again, but we'll see if we can't get it back. Uh, so, Chris, the issue of making sure we get connectivity and the like really directly relates to the issue of equity, making sure that students, no matter what kind of a income the household they come from has, has access to their education. There are other people for whom, however, being physically proximate may be the issue of equity for them. I'm thinking in terms of, for example, a lot of students who have IEPs, not all, educa individual education plans, what we used to call special education students, and some still do, uh, they're not having access if they're not physically proximate or getting direct instruction. So describe a little bit about how it is that districts are approaching that and what your guidelines might be recommending in that regard. Mm -hmm. Our guidance is pretty simple, which is you have to follow civil rights law for students with disabilities, both federal and state. So there's no, we're not walking away from that responsibility. Districts know they have a responsibility. Again, unlike in the spring where our buildings were physically closed under the governor's order, they are available for this kind of work today. So what districts are doing is trying to deploy a remote learning model. Uh, many students with uh, in, uh, disabilities can learn effectively remotely. They need additional supports. But there are students who really need therapies and other supports that are not going to be effective remote. And so our buildings are available. And our guidance to districts is you need to make this obligation uh, something that you fulfill. And if that means individualized education programming, IEPs that are amended as necessary to bring students in or to bring resources to them or to find a community partner, uh, we've told them to do what it takes to make that happen. Those can take a little time, particularly in the summer when some staff are off by contract, but they are back now. They are very deep into this right now and trying to now build one-to-one -one customized solutions for each family. And of course, making the buildings available begs all sorts of other issues. Namely, do the people who are there have adequate access to personal protective equipment? Does the district have the resources for them as well as the cleaning that is necessary to ensure a safe environment? Uh, do they have the resources or the layout that would enable them to keep socially distance between, uh, between students and the like? So talk some about what the current implications are with respect to uh, in-person learning and what that means to the district and what it means to the staff. Because we often think about the possibility of the students contracting the virus among one another or bringing it home. But of course, they will, in these instances, be face-to-face -face with staff who might be vulnerable. It's such a powerful question, uh, Congressman Heck, because we have always tried to keep in mind students and staff. These are folks who are in concert with each other for six or seven hours. But of course, there's 17 other hours of their life uh, where they might bring a risk of the, that's, that's acquired at school back to their family or candidly something they get in the community that they bring back into the building. I, I am certain that is why public health has said, hey, your average building is 500 students. It makes no sense to send a million kids back into this circumstance. You'll spike cases as we've seen in Texas and Florida, uh, as we've seen um, in Georgia and other places. So we built a very robust uh, framework that the Department of Health has, uh, was leader on. Cleaning, screening, hand hygiene, six feet of physical distancing and face coverings for any activity that goes on in our buildings. Again, most people will start remote, but for some limited activities in schools, uh, we've got a really good health framework. The challenge is that not every facility has got the right HVAC, for example. So we know there are some facilities that are not appropriate to use, even in a limited circumstance. So between six feet of physical distancing and some facilities that aren't adequate, there's no way to bring back every student right now, even if the county instantly dropped into that low category which is why you're seeing so much innovation trying to accommodate families who want to be remote, families who want to be in hybrid, and families who want to be face-to-face. -face. Uh, it's a tremendous challenge. The PPE is in pretty good shape, thanks to you uh, personally and our delegation and others around the country. You supplied CARES Act funds, $200 million went to our school districts for this exact reason. They have resources as they bring back students uh, to make sure there's enough PPE, cleaning, hygiene, 
Uh, the stuff folks need to be effective on this, including getting all these educators trained for this sort of uh, hybrid model or back and forth model. So Congress really partnering with the state is powerful here. It gave us a great opportunity. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the next step congressionally. And then, Lauren, I'd like to get into constituent questions for Chris. And that is what Congress should do. Obviously, in the HEROES Act, which Congress in the House of Representatives passed in May, we provided nearly a trillion dollars in local and state government aid. It's important that people understand this. First of all, the local and state government aid is the biggest sticking point between the House and the Senate. And it is that which relieves the pressure on the state legislature to make reductions wherever they can because of a shortage of revenues. Obviously, revenues have fallen off the table for all local and state governments. So while in Washington state, our Article 9, Section 1 constitutional protection uh, means that 96 and a half or some such percent of our K-12 budget is exempt from reduction, that doesn't mean the other three and a half percent couldn't be whacked out altogether. And it doesn't mean uh, for example, that the resources to provide these additional resources would be available, right? I mean, if you need additional money for cleaning or replacing your HVAC system, it's going to be all the much easier to do if Congress steps up, frankly, the Senate steps up and do what the House did to provide additional support to state government. So just thought I would put that plug in for local and state government aid because it really does matter to the K-12 system nationally in particular, but to some degree, in Washington state, constitutional protections notwithstanding. Lauren. Thank you. Our first question today comes from Lindley who is watching live. What options will be available if schools open to a hybrid or all in-person model, but parents are still not confident that it is safe to return? Superintendent Reichdahl. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Districts are really building two, two plans. In the summer cases were way down in April and May we were preparing for a full uh, start of in-person learning. And then after 4th of July, the cases just exploded up again. The good news about that, if there is, is that districts know how to bring students back and they're prepared to do that when it's safe. But now it also means they've built this remote model. So they're hearing from a lot of families who say, I'm still not really confident if you could bring them back that I'd want my child in there yet. And so most districts are offering uh, options. They're saying, uh, uh, when we come back, you can stick with an online plan, uh, either through the district themselves, or we've got uh, really the expert districts around the state who have been doing this for many years, or uh, join the hybrid model and have a combination of remote learning as well as in person. So um, yeah, I think parents in almost every district will have that option. That is local control. They're deciding that. But every district has been parallel planning a face-to-face -face open and sort of a hybrid remote open. And so I think you're gonna see a lot of options. It's part of the innovation that's gonna evolve out of this thing permanently uh, when we get through. Let's, let's tie this back to the three risk levels, high, moderate, and low, and the incidence of infection. Here's what we think we know. Because we had a little bit of a surge over the summer, early summer, and the urgency with which the communication picked up on, please wear your mask, please maintain social distancing, please wash your hands, seems to have had the effect of beginning to decline the incidence per 100,000. And if we want that to continue so that we can have as much direct instruction as possible, then we must not let our foot off the gas, wear your mask, wash your hands, maintain social distancing. There is no assurance that there will be a vaccine both approved and manufactured let alone distributed and, and actually implemented uh, prior to next spring would be kind of a reasonable or educated guess. But that doesn't mean that we can't make a lot of progress if we follow the recommendations of the public health officials, wear your mask, maintain social distances, wash your hands and the like. Lauren. Thank you. This next question comes from Homes First, a leasing nonprofit who is watching live. We are hearing some frustration in the community in Thurston County about the lack of scheduling information for our younger kiddos. Parents are challenged to figure out what their schedule needs to look like. Any hope that our parents will get more information soon? We're only a week away to the first day of school. Superintendent Reichdahl? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, the framework that's been set about, of course, in our state definitely has our locally elected school boards totally in control of their schedules as they were pre-COVID. So, we really need families to make those tough calls right now and say, hey, if I haven't heard from my district, I'm gonna reach out to the district office. I'm gonna call them and I'm gonna say, what's the plan? What's the connectivity? Uh, they are deploying this right now. They have their schedules in place in Thurston County for each of the districts. 
and it is time if you have not directly heard from uh, your school or your district, it is time to make that reach out to them because they are in position now to know their schedules. It'd be a little bit different for elementary school than middle and high, uh, but they do have their plans in place. And for most of the districts in Thurston County, it's also meant an additional deployment of Chromebooks or other hardware devices for students who don't have them. There's been a tremendous deployment in this county. And a shout out to the Homes First organization whose mission is to provide housing to low income people. It is their 30th anniversary this year. I just happened to know that as a matter of fact, this wasn't a setup whatsoever. Happy birthday, Homes First. And thank you for all the good work you do in our community, Lauren. Thank you. This question comes from David in Sumner. What accommodations, if any, are school districts going to make for parents, especially single parents, who work away from home during the school hours and are unable to assist their children with distance learning? Superintendent Reichto? Yeah, as part of our guidance to districts, we have tasked them with taking a leadership role in connecting uh, families who need care for their uh, young learners and community-based organizations or partners who have that opportunity. So you've seen our Y Cares and our Boys and Girls Clubs and all of these folks uh, really able to come back a lot over the summer. Uh, districts need to be helping families coordinate that. To facilitate that further, we're gonna make sure that those learning facilities, those, those care providers, uh, to the extent that we can get to them as quickly as we can, we're gonna make sure that they have Wi-Fi connectivity at scale so if they have multiple students there uh, who need to be logged on at the same time with their device, that they have the capacity to do that. Some are in good shape now, some need some help. I've set aside some federal dollars to connect even better all these community-based organizations uh, so that our learners can get safely to a place where they can be watched and maintain their learning uh, at that time. But again, check in with your district. They have a list of providers in the community who can help. Uh, and in some communities, they're able to offer that direct support from the school district for that provider. It's a great example of why this is causing so much stress in families in this state. It is not a desired situation whatsoever. Just as an added resource, I might mention that the statewide organization related to child care is called Child Care Aware. And if you go to their website, you can find they have a 1-800 number and they have a list of all the child care resources by community and by type. And that might be a place to start. Thank you. This next question comes from Genevieve in Olympia and was sent in through constituent mail. I'm a parent of two kids in the North Thurston Public Schools. Like other schools going to 100% remote, which is the right decision, my children's school is expecting parents to take on the role of a teaching assistant in the plan for fall 2020 curriculum. We parents cannot be expected to drain all of our resources, such as paid leave, in support of the school district's vision and without financial compensation. We simply cannot be expected to shoulder these additional financial burdens alone. In some cases, it could be enough additional burden to push a family over the edge into poverty. Congressman Heck? Thank you, Lauren, and thank you for the question. Uh, again, I'm going to refer you back to the HEROES Act, which passed the House in May and still sits in the Senate, but which we are attempting to negotiate with the Senate. It had several provisions designed to buffer the impact on families. It had a $1,200 per adult payment and $1,200 per dependent payment, just cash grant along the lines that was provided in the original CARES Act. It, of course, would extend the $600 a week unemployment bonus uh, which most mainstream economists would acknowledge is the thing that kept literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people from falling into poverty. And then it includes a massive rent relief uh, provision, which I'm very proud of because it was basically my bill that was included in the Hebrews Act. So we are trying in any number of ways to make sure that we mitigate the impacts of this terrible recession and pandemic on individuals. And we will continue to try to do that. Chris, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, again, we know that this is an enormous hardship for families, and I would really encourage folks to connect with their school district to say, uh, you were tasked with helping us understand the providers in the community and the options that we have, um, and those districts will have a pretty good sense of what's possible there. These federal dollars will be enormous, and I know it is tough. I know it is a hard, hard moment right now. I've got two kids of my own in public school, and we're both working adults here as parents, uh, so it's very, very challenging. But we don't get to come back to school, according to public health experts, until we get our cases down. So while we are struggling through this together, we got to wear masks, we got to stay physically distanced, uh, and we cannot take this lightly because uh, those case counts are going to continue to cause public health 
uh, to recommend that we stay remote. We're, we are truly, truly in this together. My worst fear is that we get overconfident with progress, not realizing that progress is very fragile and we just simply have to stay at it. Lauren, next question, please. Thank you. This comes from Kelsey and was submitted through Facebook. Why is it allowable for some school districts to charge money for childcare provided at the school by district employees, but not safe to send kids to school? Superintendent Reichdahl? Yeah, I'd really like, um... Of, of email. I mean, this is, I'm serious about this. Um, Chris.rakedahl at k12.wa.us. I really want to hear about this because uh, what we have observed is that school districts, of course, are trying to make the facilities as available as possible to their community based organizations, their Boys and Girls Clubs, their YMCAs, other care providers, physically because they want to uh, obviously accommodate those organizations when parents need childcare. And they've got great connectivity there so kids can stay there and do their work in a way that's in small groups, small cohorts, which is what public health has encouraged with an emphasis on K3 or K5, not bringing back hundreds of kids, which will spike cases. What I do not want to see is school districts themselves charging for that. Um, I understand that nonprofits have to stay afloat and so they might be uh, using those facilities and having to charge families, but I really want folks to send me uh, information about that. If you believe you have a school district that is charging families directly, uh, I want to know about that because I want to answer. You know, it, it is again representative of how difficult the situation is. Um, and it is exceedingly difficult. It's ex exceedingly difficult on everyone. Uh, there are instances where there's simply no option. Uh, assuming the child care provider uh, provides that service on as safe a basis as possible, maintaining social distancing and mask and plenty of cleaning. Uh, these very well could be the children or parents who have no option in life but to work, uh, whose jobs are such that they cannot perform those responsibilities at home. And none of us would argue that they leave a six-year-old or a four-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old at home all day by themselves. Um, this is not a good situation. Thank you. This next question comes from Tiffany in Olympia. My daughter is headed into first grade in Olympia School District. I understand that the definition for instructional hour was changed temporarily due to COVID. Last spring when COVID first hit, my daughter had reading time with her teacher twice a week over Zoom and was given curriculum to work on at home that consisted of links to people singing about letters and numbers. I'm very concerned headed into the new school year that the quality expectation remains the same and I have no confidence in the school's ability to support my daughter's ability to learn to read. Can you give me any reassurance? Superintendent Reichdahl? Yeah, as the closure occurred last March in our state and across the country, of course, districts were very much scrambling to figure out what they would provide for supports and how. Uh, not only were families, you know, caught off guard, all of us were, but so were educators. They were sent home as well and didn't necessarily have the tools or the connectivity to deliver a high quality instruction. That's why we have spent the last 20 weeks really building up a more robust model. And unlike last spring, we don't start the year with exemptions to our 180 school days or, or a thousand instructional hours. So it will not be six hours in front of a computer screen every day with a teacher. That's not healthy for kids. But candidly, it wasn't in face-to-face -face model. Our kids are in small groups at periods of time. They're out for recess. They've got lunch. There's passing periods and transitions. Uh, they go see a specialist. There's lots of the dynamic, uh, dynamics that go on the school day. So you'll see something like that now. But the structure that is provided uh, now is uh, as it would be in a normal year. Districts are responsible for deploying a model where students have the opportunity to engage in formal learning guided by educators, again, sometimes independently, but for their thousand hours, which is roughly five and a half or six hours a day. Doesn't mean direct, direct screen time the whole time, but it is also not the case like in the spring where teachers said, hey, as long as I know that you were uh, really in good position, you knew your grades, you're good to go. This is full engagement uh, with full evaluation of that learning. So. Again, this is new for everyone. Uh, there are states really struggling with this. We have a pretty good model we've built, but it will not be perfect by any means. It will be light years ahead of what we saw in the spring. Chris, you had acknowledged that in-person learning is better or in-person instruction is better than distance learning. By definition, that means students aren't going to learn as much as they otherwise would have. So my question is, uh, 
is there beginning to be an effort to think through what happens when we can return to full in-person learning, given that students are going to be coming to us not where they otherwise would have been had they received in-person learning all along? Yeah, let me take the three quick approaches to it. One, um, we've challenged districts to narrow their learning standards down. We have a long list of standards and there's a, districts don't get to all of them ever. So they have to pick and choose. We say get really, really focused so that students are prepared for their next step. There's also some things we have in our curriculum typically uh, that we think right now may be uh, a, a greater opportunity to jettison some of those. Uh, I don't want to devalue anything, but we have a 100, hour, 100 minutes a week PE requirement, for example, uh, in kindergarten through sixth grade. We're likely to waive those. And so um, there's definitely going to be some loss here, but the really core instructional stuff should proceed. And those are typically the things we assess in numeracy, mathematics, lang English language arts, and all of that. Um, and then we are also working with the governor right now and some legislators to talk about what it might look like to have extended services uh, well beyond for a couple of years. Uh, it starts, quite frankly, with teachers with really good evaluation of where students are today, both academic and social emotional. We have task districts. They are required to have universal screeners for that. So we will have a pretty solid understanding of where kids are one classroom at a time, because those are the experts, our teachers. Um, and then they will put a thousand instructional model together. And we will know this year uh, along the way where students are and where we have gaps, just as we did last year when we uh, offered incomplete grades and put the responsibility on districts to really connect with kids who got an incomplete. Again, not ideal, uh, significantly better structure, and certainly better than we see in most states. Um, I, I think folks are gonna find it less than ideal, as you put it, Congressman, because obviously we wanna be in person, uh, but given the health folks control when we come back, I think we have put together something uh, in 20 weeks that is uh, just simply one of the better models in the country. Lauren. Thank you. We have a couple of comments on the Facebook Live about the impact on families, on the, about the financial impact. Katrina wrote, I'm not hearing realistic solutions here for most families. And Frank followed up, I agree with Katrina regarding the financial impact to low and middle class families. It feels like the burden is being placed on them without any defined financial assistance. Congressman Heck, would you like to respond? Well, again, we're doing everything we can in the Congress to buffer the impact of the recession on people's lives. I mentioned the three examples before, but there are plenty of other examples. We passed for, uh, for yet another example, a $50 billion childcare grant program uh, to assist childcare providers. And at the same time, we passed a bill that would substantially increase the childcare tax credit. Uh, like the HEROES Act, these are circling Senator Mitch McConnell's desk awaiting his action. But those are just two more examples of a very long list of things that we are doing to try and really make a difference in the lives of people. It is not as though we are unaware of the impact on uh, families, and I'm painfully aware of it. We hear these stories every day. We receive these stories every day, and we are fighting, fighting, fighting to try to provide the aid. Just as we did in the first four bills that passed, the difference is uh, this time uh, we're encountering a much more recalcitrant uh, United States Senate, which seems to be unwilling to, to engage in a principal compromise. Now to put some really boring numbers on this, the HEROES Act contained, I think, $3.2 trillion of various kinds of aids to make a difference in your life uh, for these kinds of issues. The Senate initially said, we're not willing to do anything. And then after many, many weeks, they said, okay, we'll provide a trillion dollars. And by the way, there was no local or state government aid the importance of which I've already outlined. And negotiations got very difficult. Finally, in exasperation, our team said, okay, we'll come down a trillion dollars from our package, from 3.2 trillion to 2.2, if you come up a trillion. And they were told, no way. And after they were told, no way, the trillion dollar offer from the Senate was reduced to 500 billion. So not only did they tell us to pound sand, they actually went south on what was on the table. And if it seems to you as though I am frustrated with the situation, you are reading it exactly correct because American families are hurting. It's like that old expression, break glass in case of emergency. This is an emergency. This is the job of the federal government to step up and partner with local governments, especially school districts and cities and towns and state governments and American families. After all, 
there's absolutely nothing a single American family did wrong to cause this recession to visit us. It was the pandemic. This is the job of the federal government. Just like in the wake, for example, of the devastating Hurricane Sandy, we stepped up and helped people. Why? Because it wasn't their fault and no individual would possess the resources to be able to protect themselves in the aftermath. And I'll just add, Congressman, this is why I think some of us in many ways are trying to put the best solutions we can. And then we are just heart sunk because the public has been really clear with me. We want learning to go on. We want those teachers uh, in seats putting out lessons. We want uh, learning to be evaluated. We want counselors, mental health support. We want the stuff we can get, even if it has to be remote. So we're deploying your basic education dollars with an intense focus on re um, kind of imagining the learning model which means we don't have an extra 500 million or a billion dollars to do child care subsidies. It's why legislators are saying, let's get back to town in many ways. Let's continue to press on Congress. There has got to be something here for families because the dollars we have in basic ed, they're going to educators right now to really build out this model. We are teaching this year. They are fully uh, uh, functional. They are eight, nine, 10 hours a day working in our school year. So I wish I could tell you there was a pot of money available because we have told our legislators in our state that is the thing that really makes us come together is that families have a significant subsidy to pay for child care. It doesn't look like our state will have that in the short term. Congress has options. You've heard Congressman Heck, the House has put those options forward. It would create an enormous opportunity very quickly for families and it's a bit hung up there. So we definitely need folks advocating for this. If cruise lines, which I would argue are the quintessential thing that is optional in a market like this, if cruise lines uh, can get these benefits and some airlines, which I, I, I support, but if they can get federal benefits and federal help, uh, I, I find it stunning that the U.S. Senate cannot figure out a way to get families child care subsidies during this time. Here, here. Although in fairness, because we all like to paint an institution and every individual in it with the same brush, I feel duty bound to remark that both Senators Cantwell and Murray are entirely supportive of the kinds of aid packages that we're talking about here. Uh, entirely supportive. Lauren. Thank you. This next question comes from Cindy, who is watching live. What role might outdoor education play this fall, especially with the little guys? Superintendent Reichtel? Yeah, it's a really awesome question. So we've got some districts getting pretty creative about this while our weather holds out. And even sometimes when it doesn't, um, there's clearly an opportunity to do some outdoor education. We've got public private partnerships with that. We've got school districts who are trying to engage students. Again, our local health officials have said that's a little better opportunity. If you were outdoors, it's easier to physically distance. That cough, that sneeze, that droplet falls immediately to the ground uh, in the open air. So we definitely see some of that going on. We've got some higher ed institutions even trying it. So Again, that's that balance of saying to districts, you are technically available if you want to deploy these things. We want you to consider them. And local school boards and districts are deciding how to do that. But outdoor ed is a great way to do it while our weather holds out. Uh, there's some models being considered around the state, including in Seattle. Um, and so I would really encourage folks if they're interested in that to push on your school board and your administrators and say, what could we do to bring kids together once in a while for this opportunity? Um, I can tell you, your bus drivers would appreciate that because they're nervous that they too are going to find themselves without jobs. And so we are looking for every way we can to move food around and hot spots, and move kids around to learning opportunities. And the more we engage and the more we try to bring this model back of in-person learning, the better everyone is. So I, I really love the idea. Thank you. So Chris, you remind me that the governor this week or last week signed an executive order making it easier to retain bus drivers. And in addition to that, we have just received word that there's been a waiver on the meal provision and delivery thereof. I won't get into the nuances of this, but both of these things make it easier for school districts to afford to retain uh, bus drivers. It just strikes me that if we are not to do that and perhaps even more, then we run the risk of, lo of losing uh, trained portion of our personnel that when we need them again aren't going to be immediately available if we don't figure out a way to keep them connected to our k-12 workforce your reaction yeah we have been working for weeks um, with school districts uh, the governor's office the legislature labor partners community partners we have been trying to solve this juggernaut 
we, we got to an okay place, which certainly allows us to move things around besides students. So instead of all kids being able to come to our buildings, we want to bring our learning to students, which means delivering food. And now at a larger scale, uh, we want to bring them connectivity where that's appropriate. We're even going to make sure that we allow school districts who, who have to work with families and the family says, listen, okay, I figured out a child care option. I can't get my kid there though. We're going to allow our school districts to help in transporting students from their home to their learning center that they've figured out. And so we're trying to create everything we can right now to reduce barriers and to keep folks gainfully employed. We do not need to add more people uh, to unemployment and, and exacerbate the economic impact if we can deploy them in support of families. And this food option uh, is very, very good. We're very grateful that the Department of Ag has now authorized it. It's going to allow a lot more families to be fed this year who otherwise would have gone through a lot of paperwork for income verification. Our districts can now just focus on who needs it right now. Thank you. This next question comes from Kimberly, who is watching live. I live in Pierce County, and you had mentioned that the Pierce County Health Department is the only county health department that is making the decision whether schools can be opened or closed. Why aren't other health county health departments making those decisions? You said that local school boards had the choice, but Pierce County took away that choice and did not ask for board input. The governor recently said that the local communities will have the decision to open schools in whatever capacity that may be, but this appears not to be the case. Superintendent Reichdahl? Yeah, the governor and I, uh, as we kind of worked through his last resolution, uh, it was really important that we obviously follow the health framework as closely as possible. And we trusted that school boards would do that, and they've done that. Uh, they have done their very best to follow that framework and keep public health as their primary interest, and we trusted that that would be enough. And um, we also knew that there were counties in the state that are large and remote, and, and one part of the county might be experiencing some COVID impacts, while others were virtually uh, untouched by it. So we didn't want blanket decisions about, you know, everyone uh, would be out, at least not from the state level. The governor was not interested in that. We understand that county health officials have their own statutory authority as experts in public health to make their own determination. And in the case of Pierce County, uh, that particular public health official has determined that he does not want schools opening, public or private, um, in the fashion that we were going to let school boards determine. I do believe he still allows for maybe five or fewer folks, small cohorts that allow for contact tracing. And, and certainly that will create a very robust public health framework. Uh, but I understand that that definitely is a little bit in contrast to the interest of the governor. And it puts a little bit of conflict between public and private school boards and a local health official. It is his legal authority. Um, I, I, I want to be very candid with you. I, I don't agree with it. I think we already had a framework in place. Uh, but it is his authority, and I don't question his public health uh, purpose for this, uh, but it has certainly caused some, some challenges as only one county has done it, and you've got families on those borders of those other counties who are saying, if I go two miles over the line, I can access uh, a school potentially public or private that is available. So uh, I, I wish that region was a little more coordinated. I'm, I'm a personally disappointed in the decision, but I do understand it's his legal authority to do that. And a little bit of a news update in that regard. The infection incidence in Pierce County has now dropped below 75 for the last 14 days. It's at 72. I believe Dr. Chen will probably take a little bit longer of a wait and see attitude, but they're now in moderate risk, whereas they were not just a short time ago. And that may or may not then indicate a difference in direction by the school districts in Pierce County. Stay tuned. Thank you. This next question comes from Antoinette and was submitted during a prior Facebook Live Town Hall. Antoinette wrote, what help is there for mental issues to help children cope? Superintendent Reichdahl? Yeah, as part of our back to school requirements that our local boards are adopting the return plans, districts need to have what we call social emotional screeners in place. So we've got trained professionals who um, have the ability to really engage with young people and do evaluations of their mental health. Uh, I think it's tougher online, candidly, than it is when you see them in person. You see them interacting in person. You see behaviors. You see um, a lot of things that I think um, round out an evaluation of a student need. So um, this will be a little more challenging. I'm, I'm heartened that most school districts are choosing to spend the front end of their school year really building relationships with kids and really trying to understand where they are, how they've been impacted by the closure, what they need in terms of contacts. Um, from adults and, and peers. 
I always tell folks when I was a classroom teacher, we've got a lot of time to get the content. We've got a lot of time to get to our history here. Um, I don't have a lot of time to make a first impression with a young person so that they know how much I care about them and that I'm listening to them uh, more than I am obsessed with my history uh, that I want to give to them. And so uh, we've got great professionals ready to do this. It is an expectation of our districts that they do this. They've all submitted reopening plans and attested to the fact that they are committed to that. Uh, please talk to your local school district if you feel that you've got a child or somebody you are close to really needs some additional evaluation. I truly, truly want to encourage you to talk to your school district. We set policy and guidance at the state level. They are the magic on the ground that can pick up a phone, call a family, <coughs> uh, Sarah or Michael in, and let's really have a one-to-one -one conversation. Safely distance with all the proper PPE. They can do that in their buildings this year, unlike last year. And a program note. The question asker there, Antoinette, is our superstar. I believe she has perfect attendance at all 24 town halls, and she always asks really good questions. We so, so appreciate her continuing interest in our programming. Thank you, Antoinette, yet again. Thank you. This next question comes from John and Puyallup. I have a disabled adult son whom I claim as a dependent on my taxes. He's no more able to work and no less dependent on me for support than a minor child, yet we were denied even the $500 Dependent Stimulus Award. This is discrimination against disabled people and is a travesty. This error must be corrected in the next stimulus bill, and those in our situation should get the original $500 as well. Congressman Heck? Couldn't agree more. That's why included, we included the fix in the HEROES Act. Uh, as a matter of fact, Angie Craig from Minnesota offered that legislation. I was proud to co-sponsor it, and we folded it into the legislation. And it is retroactive because you're absolutely correct. It was unfair. It was discriminatory, and it didn't make sense. Once again, it's circling over the desk of Mitch McConnell in the United States Senate. We'll keep after it. Thanks for asking, Lauren. Thank you. We're running out of time, so I'm just going to ask one last question before closing comments. Our last question comes from Ray in Furcrest. I'm hoping that you can speak to a timeline or any plans that might include in-person classes for our students. Our children would like to see their friends and teachers, but we as parents also wanna make sure that everyone, including those teachers and individuals who are most vulnerable are safe when attending in-person classes. Superintendent Reichdahl. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think it lies in the public health framework. So obviously getting our case counts down, if you're in Furcrest, you're in Pierce County there. Um, and as you heard Congressman Heck say, that there's progress. Uh, that county has moved below the 75 per 100,000 case threshold. Um, if we continue to kind of work as a community together to bring those numbers down, school districts then get the option to begin to open up. We've encouraged them to not uh, just, you know, throw everyone back in, but to be pretty uh, judicious about this. We see the best practices in other countries, and we have studied 12 to 14 other nations, they start small, and that was in the governor's proclamation. So starting with kindergarten through third graders, uh, small cohorts, uh, beginning to uh, get our, our staff and our families comfortable with this idea of a return to school. So uh, districts have this in their planning framework. It is about getting those cases down and then watching the districts slowly deploy those models and continuing to watch the cases to make sure that public education is not contributing to the health risks of students, staff, and family members when they, you know, go back out of our buildings and into their into their homes. So there's a little bit of a dial here. We've got to get cases down in order to bring student opportunities up. And um, I know this has been tough, y'all, uh, but I just cannot reiterate enough that there is no new money out there. So we are trying to do all of this within our existing resources unless we get some additional help here. And I am I am grateful for the grace that people have offered their school districts. These are local decisions. They're brutal. There is no easy answer here. Uh, but the one thing in common is if we work together, wear our face coverings, physically distance and get our cases down, lots of things can happen. Schools opening up more of the economy and really getting this uh, economy humming the way we had pre-COVID. Thank you, Chris. Good to set it better. I'm wondering if at this time, as we close out, if there's anything that you said before you want to reemphasize or anything that our questioning didn't provide you with the opportunity to talk about that you think would be important for viewers to hear. Well, again, we've kind of switched from the statewide planning efforts and the governor's hard work on his proclamations and the State Department of Health with their health guidance. We've really had to make that switch from the larger framework we've now supplied to local, hard local decisions. 
And I would just really encourage folks of the 10th Congressional District, if you still have questions, deployment questions, what are the options for my student? I still need a device. We're now to that point where those really subtle questions, you got to deliver to your local building principal, teacher, or your superintendent in your local district. Uh, they've got those plans in place now. They want to hear from families that they haven't been able to get to you. Uh, they've got the concept of what they're doing now, and they want to connect with you. So please reach out to your individual district now about the, the things you need to have success and what resources they might have for you. Chris Recknell, State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Thank you very much. I never know whether to be more impressed with the breadth and depth of your knowledge or your absolute commitment to school uh, children and students in this state to do right by them. Today, I'm impressed by both very much. So Chris, thanks for being here. Thank you all for watching yet again. As I love to say, you're giving of your most precious commodity, your time. Hope you'll consider doing so again tomorrow when we have the fourth episode in our seven part series on the reaction of our state's educational institution to the pandemic. Our guest at five o'clock tomorrow, September 1st will be Jan Yoshiwara, the executive director of the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. Because this isn't just a K-12 issue, it extends into colleges, uh, indeed into graduate school. I, I fully anticipate an informative and lively, lively conversation then, just as we had today. So again, thank you for being here. Mask up, maintain social distance, wash your hands, be safe, be healthy. Thank you. <laughs>